Now we'll talk a little bit about what happened immediately after World War II. Um, and I think that Murakawa rightly begins this carceral explosion, not with Reagan and Nixon, but even with Truman, about a lot of the ways they were very aware of, of how certain communities were going to have to be dealt with given uh, a lot of the the economic boom but a lot of the way that that these populations were also excluded from this this economic boom that happened in this country after the war uh, so we will look more into that but the next moment the next marker in terms of the the narrative of the enlightenment sh and shadows is 1965. <clears throat> we'll call this a dot or a point of point of light the the voting rights act of course, the, 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 the Voting Rights Act was the culmination of the many battles that occurred uh, on the streets of Alabama and the streets of, of, of Oklahoma and, and Detroit and, and many other places in this country that uh, were part of the, the, the civil rights movement. Um, but in terms of legislation, you had the Voting Rights Act, which states, which prohibits states from imposing any, quote, voting qualification or prerequisite to voting or standard practice or procedure to deny or abridge the right of any citizen of the United States to vote on account of race or color. So even though we already had that instantiated in the 15th Amendment, it had to be restated uh, in, in law at, the, uh, at this moment. But it was nonetheless an important uh, uh, statement of uh, or restatement of the need to include uh, all, all persons in the political process. And then, you know, it, for LBJ, we could, we could talk a lot about LBJ and, and, and the global policies, of course, Vietnam. But in terms of domestic policy, um, there was a brief moment where the, the uh, war against poverty was a central aspect of, of, of policy. So, um, the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964 in LBJ's War on Poverty um, states, this administration today, here and now, declares un an unconditional war on poverty in America. I urge this Congress and all Americans to join me in that effort. Poverty is a national problem requiring improved national organization and support. But this attack to be effective must also be organized at the state and local level. For the war against poverty will not be won here in Washington. It be, must be won in the field, in every private home, in every public office, from the courthouse to the White House. Very often, a lack of jobs and money is not the cause of poverty, but the symptom. Our aim is not only to relieve the symptoms of poverty, but to cure it and, above all, to prevent it. No single piece of legislation, however, is going to suffice. So at least in the language of it, there was an acknowledgement of a, a deep systemic problem with the issue of poverty and how the poverty and the systemic problems were the cause and a lot of the uh, social unrest or all of these things that are then further criminalized, uh, many unrightfully so, the war on drugs, for example, um, are, are really symptoms of a, deep, uh, a, a deeper cause and a more systemic malaise or sickness. So um, there was that, at least in the rhetoric acknowledgement of that, of course, now, if we look at, you know, uh, the, the way that uh, capitalism and neoliberalism has further accumulated the wealth in this country and the, the, the global wealth, we see how that war went. And of course, the, the irony, if not the outright problematic use of violent language to describe this, you know, it's always the war on poverty. It's always we are at war with the virus. It's always the war on drugs. So the, the use of that kind of language might itself um, be contributing to the types of violences that are then somehow justified by the the uh, the attempt to address a larger problem. Think utilitarianism, right? Using the end to justify the means. Now, the shadow to this these important moments, the Voting Rights Act and the the War on Poverty. Uh, was the Omnibus Crime Control and uh, Safe Streets Act in 1968. And 1968 was also an important year in this country that if you talk to a lot of your, you know, pr professors that are in their 60s and 70s, uh, especially at the New School, uh, this was a moment where there was a real belief that something like 
a, a revolution, a progressive revolution or a leftist revolution might take hold. There was a lot of um, protests on, on, uh, at universities. There was a lot of um, uprising and marches, not just in terms of civil rights, but in, in terms of these, these policies that uh, are more democratic, uh, more um, socially conscious uh, that that would would bring about a, a country that it was was really actually about of the people and by the people and for the people, but this also was perceived and and framed as also and this is the whole point of the first civil right of Nixon was that this was seen as a civil unrest, as as rabble rousing and and we saw this in the early twentieth century with a lot of the reports that all of you did on um, the criminalization of anarchists and, and communists in the interwar period. So during this time, one of the responses was the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act, um, which I'll just read excerpts from it, uh, was meant to prevent crime and to ensure the great greater safety of the people. Law enforcement efforts must be better coordinated, intensified, and made more effective at all levels of government. It is therefore the declared policy of the Congress to assist state and local governments in strengthening and improving law enforcement at every level by national assistance. So here you go. I mean, this is, in, in words, the beginning of, of law and order par politics, at least formally. You know, of course, it had been going on uh, latently all along. So this is the manifestation of that in, a, in, in, in terms of legislation. And then in 1970, the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevent and Control Act. Uh, this provided the, the legal base, basis for the, the war on drugs, not to mention a, a lot of uh, international policy that was tied up inside the Cold War and the domino theory and an easy excuse to, to infiltrate and combat and topple democratically elected socialist uh, governments, certainly in, in Latin America. Um, it consolidated laws on manufacturing and distributing drugs of all kinds, including narcotics, hallucinogens, steroids, chemicals. Um, and this is the one that made, made up the scheduling drugs, Schedule 1, Schedule 2, things like this. So uh, this happened in this, this moment. That was the legislative uh, beginning of the war on drugs, which came after it. 